<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey everybody, happy 2023, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Eggs. This year is hitting the ground running with social media expert and owner of Social Hire, Tony Restel. Tony is a multiple-time founder and entrepreneur who, after selling his previous startup, pivoted from selling ads to companies recruiting fresh talent to helping those same companies find social media marketing success. With an eye for largely professional service organizations selling B2B and B2C, Social Hire helps reduce the noise, risk, and trepidation commonly associated with social media marketing and turns it into a viable business development tool. Tony joins us today, all the way from the UK, for an exciting conversation about the effectiveness of social media marketing and how to ensure success, or more importantly, avoid costly failure, how to diagnose issues with your current social media efforts and when to enlist the help of a professional, how to get quick wins from whatever audience you may already have, and so much more. Please join us in kicking off our collective best year ever with special guest, Tony Restel. Tony, how are you? I'm probably well indeed, thanks. Thank you ever so much for having me on the show. Yeah, you're you're calling in from the UK supposedly, right? So that's, that's uh, what's what point. time is it there right now? So it is uh, half past five in the evening. Oh, well, thank you for making time in the evening for us. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, it's amazing. So, Tony, can we just I guess start at the beginning and tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, you know how you got to what you're doing today? Sure. Yeah. So I run a social media agency called Social Hire. Uh, we're focused on working with B two B small businesses, uh, so typically companies that are you know looking to sell into other business organisations. Um, clients will be you know consulting firms, recruitment businesses, training companies, technology companies, anyone that um, you know has an identifiable business audience that they want to to tap into. Um, and yeah, I mean, before that, I built and sold an internet business. So I've been uh, in the online space in, you know, one guise or another since 2000. Um, where, did, where did that time go? <laughs> I know, right. Now, I love that, though. Well, a big portion of our audience are entrepreneurs, but in, you know, startup founders, CEOs, people like that. And so I think that social media is one of those things that sort of all these years later, like still kind of continues to elude. And as you're one of the the first episodes of ours that will air in 2023, I think it's really important that we maybe sort of set the rules or maybe talk about what is social media marketing in 2023. Well, I mean, it's really interesting that so many um, small businesses that we talk to and, and entrepreneurs um, still haven't really got to grips with it. You know, it's, it's a real minority that we talk to that have got to the point where they can really say each quarter, you know, this is what social media has done for our business. Um, so there's there's this widespread feeling that, yes, we need to be doing social media, um, but most businesses still haven't cracked, you know, how is this actually contributing to our business and our bottom line each quarter? Um, and, and for me, you know, whatever new fads there are, whatever new platforms there are, where, you know, whatever changes to happen to Twitter over the coming year, you know, actually the fundamental thing is why is it worth our time investing in this? Uh, you know, and, and what do we need to do for this to actually produce a return for the business? That's that's always, you know, my focus with social media. So can I ask you, I mean, other than clicks and vanity metrics, how can you determine that? How can you figure out what the return is other than, oh, I got – a thousand likes or 500 likes on this post and yeah that feels good and 500 people saw your your brand you know whatever it is but that doesn't equate to the bottom dollar so how can you actually figure figure that out and what the return is for a client do you have like a starting point and then you track it and and you can tell hey we generated an, an additional forty thousand dollars of revenue for your business is how does it work great question it's really interesting uh, if you speak to people who've had posts go really viral on any of the platforms. And I actually, just I have an experience of that that I'll share here in a second. So it's it's usually the case that that results in very little business mm -hmm. uh, because you know going viral gets you in front of a ton of people, um, but do they actually have an interest in buying whatever it is your business sells? 
Um, and because the virality of that post gets you in front of all sorts of different people, um, you know, it, it, it's quite rare that that really is transformative for a business. Obviously, you know, th there's some social media usage where you're just going so globally, you know, massive that it could take a business that isn't known to one that is. But um, the, the, the two things that I would highlight, uh, depending on whether you're B2B or B2C, you know, in our space of B2B, what we're looking to do for businesses is help them get to the point where, you know, each quarter they can look at, here's all the sales calls that we've had, or here's all the people who have attended our business breakfast, or here's all the people who've requested a demo of what our technology platform does. And you can go through that and you can identify which of those originated from what you did on social media. Okay. And so at the end of, you know, the end of a year, you're not looking back and saying, oh, you know, we've had this many more likes this, this year than last year, or, you know, this many more people have read our blogs, but you're actually saying no, you know, of the, you know, however many hundred sales meetings we had this year, this portion of them came through social media. And obviously, over time, you can then track that back to sales as well, depending how many months it is for you to make a sale, once you've had a meeting. Um, so that's how it would work from a B2B perspective. If you're in B2C, so you know, you're trying to sell to the mass consumer market, um, very often that'll be done through advertising and, and advertising funnels. And at that point, you know, it's it's very trackable. You know, you spend X thousand dollars on on ads in a week or a month, and you track that through to how many sales did that produce for the business. And and that's either, you know, obviously produced a a positive return or it hasn't. Um, so those are the kinds of social media activities that I think really make a lot of sense because you can clearly see, you know, the return that the business is getting uh, versus what a lot of small businesses do, which is just feel like we've got to be on social media because it's what everyone, you know, where everyone is. Yeah. Um, I I think it's hilarious. There's, I, um, there's credit unions and stuff in the area that uh, you, they make their employees do these TikTok dances and they do all this other stuff. And I just feel bad for the employees because the last thing you you want to do is actually just, okay, it's Monday, it's here, we got to do a social post and let's think of something funny. Oh, I'll do this dance or I'll do this or that. And that to me just seems like a complete waste of time. It actually, as a consumer, I see that and I'm like, what are they doing? It's just a, it, a turnoff for me personally. And mm -hmm. uh, to speak of the viral post thing that you just talked about, I actually have a client that I I work for um, and I manage their TikTok and Facebook and all that other stuff just to help out with stuff. And we had a, a post go viral on TikTok and it got over two and a half million views. And just because of that post, uh, their follower account went up and they had they got like six or seven thousand additional followers because of that one post. But in my my back of my, my head is like, great, two and a half million people saw that post. But what did it actually do for the company, you know, other than put their logo in front of two and a half million people who aren't necessarily in the market that they're in? So it, it's very, it's very interesting. So it kind of just, it, it's, it's a weird conundrum because A, you need a presence, but B, your presence, I think, could actually hurt you depending on what you're posting and C, what does the vanity metrics actually equate to? So having your feedback as far as like having an objective, like we have a, we want to get a certain amount of people in seats for this conference. We want to get a certain amount of sales calls and you can actually see those based off of a campaign. I think that's a really good approach to social posting in general. So, mm. yeah, yeah, no, I think it's funny too, just to kind of add on Mike, I, I mean, Obviously, attribution is kind of the thing, right? But it is funny how it's taken so long and, and will probably continue for some time for people to look at social media marketing the same way they do other marketing, right? I mean, a lot of them won't think twice about running a newspaper ad, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe they can establish some kind of metric that they're going against, you know, hopefully they're they're measuring. But, you know, I mean, but there's so many channels that people wouldn't even think twice about. But I think one of the problems that with that sort of set the tone for social media marketing early was this strategy of bring in, you know, the the closest 16 year old, you know, who knows how to run Twitter and let them run your social media platform, you know, and that happened, you know, in the early days, but there was a, a gold rush of sort of smoke and mirrors kinds of marketing experts who showed up 
and started, um, you know, doing social media marketing for different companies with basically little or no real marketing knowledge. They just understood the platforms. And, um, and I think that that trend is like sort of what's following us today. So in, in your work, Tony, how do you, I guess, get people over that hump? I mean, you know, I think just like anything, right? I mean, if you told me, okay, we're going to have a metric and it's going to measure out and we're going to know, and I, and I, I will be able to establish that this spend is worth something like, I mean, I guess anybody who's hiring a marketing firm could maybe wrap their head around that. But I think getting people to that initial conversation or, you know, overcoming these bias has to be extremely challenging. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think we're we're very lucky. Uh, we we do a lot of educating in the market. So we run a lot of um, free webinars on how you get results from social media. We put out a lot of content, and a lot of reports. So generally, by the time we're actually talking to a potential client, um, they're already someone who has a pretty good understanding of what it takes to get results on social media. Um, and so the number of you know conversations we'd have where people need persuading that that's the right way of going about doing things is actually, uh, you know, pretty slim. Um, but, you know, what I would say is we usually look at a 90 day window as being what's needed to start getting results. So whatever business you're in, you know, you don't have to make a massive investment and you don't have to commit a long you know time window to be able to start seeing results from social media um but i would say the single biggest thing is take the advice of the specialists in your market um and, and there's two things i'd really highlight there ryan one is social media is not all the same you know all the platforms have their own quirks and their own you know things you've got to do differently to do well on them um and getting good results for one business is not the same as getting good results for another business so we turn away a lot of business each month because when we talk to the particular businesses you know they're not in the specialist areas that we really know how to get results for them and if you think about taking on work you know if you're a social media manager or you're an agency or you're a freelancer it doesn't matter if you go into a business and you've never worked for that type of business before yes you could do a, a credible job of their social media and you could make them look professional and slick but you're going to spend the first you know six nine months just experimenting to find out what works for a business like this you know if, if a pizza restaurant chain comes to us and says could you get us more you know more table bookings more customers coming into our restaurants we wouldn't know how to do that and so we would spend the first you know six or nine months just experimenting and trying to figure that out whereas if you hire into your business someone or an agency who's already done that before for that exact type of business then it massively shortens the time horizons to start getting results and therefore, you know, massively reduces the risk that this isn't going to pay off for you. And to come back to your point about, you know, entrusting a a 16 year old to run your company's social media, um, you know, there are clearly the younger generations are hugely switched on when it comes to social media. But there's a big difference between knowing how to use the platforms and being able to do some quirky things that get huge amounts of views versus really knowing how to get results for a particular type of business. Uh, and that's really what I would stress to, uh, you know, to any business owners or decision makers tuning in for this is be really selective about who you employ or who you work with as an agency. Um, because if you if you choose someone or, or an agency or a business that has that track record, uh, it, it's just going to massively accelerate you getting results. And therefore make it much more likely that, you know, social media becomes a long-term investment that, that pays off. So uh, let's, let's play here. Like say, for example, I'm i uh, I'm looking for a social media person to uh, manage my clothing company or, or something to, to that widget a would be whatever it is. What's your onboarding process? Like when you come to a new client, what kind of questions are you asking them? What kind of information do you need? And then, um, Obviously, you have your fee for doing it, but do you need a minimum kind of uh, ad campaign budget that you need to actually work with? 
Yeah, great question. And and for me, actually, those questions start before they've become a client. So okay. we don't really want to work with a business unless before we've even started, we have a good idea that we can get great results for them. Um, because I'd rather say no and encourage them to go and find a different agency to work with if you know I can't see how we would get results for them. Um, but in answer to your question, I mean, what I would particularly want to know uh, when I'm talking to potential clients is what does their ideal customer look like? So who do they need to have meetings with or calls with or get onto a demo or get a, get FaceTime with at a business breakfast? You know, what's the demographics of those people? And actually, can they even articulate that? Um, you know, because the more you can articulate that, uh, the more it gives us a really clear audience to try and build for that business. Um, and then the second thing we really like to understand is how they currently make sales or currently get results in their business. So is there something we can already plug social media into that we know is going to work? Um, uh, because then it's very clear how that's going to contribute to, you know, business improvement um so you know to, to give you an example of that you know if, if a business says to me well you know we historically have always won all our new business by getting decision makers from i don't know the pharmaceutical industry uh you know along to a quarterly business breakfast we run and you know we know that for every 20 decision makers we get along to one of those one of them turns into a consulting client or one of them turns into a recruitment client or one of them you know engages us to do their it consulting or whatever it might be if you can see that as an agency then you can say okay well we can plug directly into that because then if i can use social media to generate a lot more attendees at your business breakfasts of the exact same kinds of people you've already got attending then it's a no-brainer that that's going to turn into you know ultimately more business for you um and and for the potential client it's also very clear to them yes you know this already works for us and i can see that if you could you know double the number of people we get along to those events we're going to double the amount of business we get. It may not be in the first month. It may not even be in the sixth sixth month, but I can see how that's going to flow. D does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I kind of maybe want to take it back a little bit to, you know, it, Mike alluded to uh, to budget and and what people mm -hmm. need to invest as, as part of this. And I, I understand that's, pro you know, a very general discussion. So I, we don't need to necessarily like pin down a number but what I want to try and understand is I think that there's probably a subsect of people who think they're doing it right. Like Mike gave an example of, you know, the credit union who's got their employees out dancing on TikTok or whatever. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's doing anything for them. Maybe it's ingratiating them to the public and that's, you know, warming up an audience or something for them. I don't know. But, um, but it seems like somebody like that probably thinks they've already got a handle on what they're doing. So why do I need a firm? So if they're going to come to a firm, I suspect that there's a set, you know, again, a subsect of people who are thinking, okay, well, this is a inexpensive means of, of doing marketing, right? This is something I don't want to spend a lot of money on because look, we already got it, you know? Hmm. So for people who are, you know, and maybe your clients are a little bigger than this, so maybe this isn't a problem, but for, for people in our audience who sort of small business owners or, you know, it, it really just trying to get started and they think social is a channel for them, I guess. First of all, how do we how do we know we have a problem and we need help? And then second of all, I mean, how big of commitment could we expect? And and you don't need to even get into dollars, but I mean, is this a a giant request? Is this something that we can get into with a minimal budget? Is there sort of a, a minimum level of engagement that it just doesn't make sense? Like you're just throwing good money after bad marketing or you know, any of that stuff. So can you maybe flesh that idea out a little bit? Mm, absolutely. I mean, a few points I'd make on that. Um the first one in, in terms of, you know, what do you need to think about to know whether you are, have got a handle on this already? I would have two specific questions I would encourage people to ask themselves. Firstly, can you clearly identify and talk about the business wins that you have had in the last few months from social media? If you can say to me, yes, you know, we've had 50 sales meetings and that's resulted in you know x amount of new business for us 
then it may well be that you've already you know you, you're doing a good job of social media already and the second question i would say is if you suddenly had a collapse in the amount of business you've got and you needed to generate lots more interest and meetings and whatever quickly do you know what you would do tomorrow to make that happen on social media and again if the answer is yes then you're in a good place if the answer is well you know i would try this or that or the other but you know i wouldn't be i wouldn't feel confident that that's going to you know bring me quick results then probably you do need help so those would be my sort of litmus tests if you like um in terms of what's involved, I mean, our, our pricing's all on our site, Ryan, so I can be very, you know, transparent about that. I actually uh, like that, by the way, that, that you're very upfront about that, and it's printed right there. So, props. Well, do you know, uh, my so I mentioned I built and sold a previous internet business, and uh, that was a job board business. So we were selling job advertisements for you know companies that wanted to make hires. And this was in the days of, you know, Monster and Simply Hired and, and those types of companies. And they would sell annual contracts and, and you couldn't see on their website at all what their pricing really was. Uh, and, you know, so every sale they made was, you know, a huge back and forth, you know, proposal and negotiations. And then in the market, everyone got wind of the fact that, you know, if you spoke to your sales rep in the last days of the month, they were desperate to hit target. And so you'd be able to get massive discounts on <laughs> the deals that you've been talking about. And so there was just this huge amount of time got lost in, you know, needless back and forth conversations. So in that business, we were always very transparent. We had our pricing on the site. As soon as we got talking to anyone, you know, we already knew they had that kind of budget. Uh, we were able to say categorically, no one gets a deal other than what's on the site. So that just closed off any time lost to negotiation. Um, so that's a bit of a historical context, but that saved us so much time uh, and made selling so much more productive for us that when I launched Social Hire, I just thought, right, we're going to follow exactly the same process here. Um, you know, it may lose me a few clients because there may be people who had they talked to us would have been persuaded that that would be a good sum of money to spend but the flip side of that is you know we don't lose time to people who don't have the budget um or indeed who are too big for us i mean you know there are corporate clients out there who are looking to spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars on an agency and if they look at us actually we're you know we're serving a smaller end of the market and and equally it's not really productive to talk to them um, but to come back to your question, Ryan, um, our top package, which is the most popular one, uh, is $1,500 a month. Uh, and that's an all in cost. And the only minimum commitment is to work with us for three months so that we basically have a 90 day window to get that first wave of sales calls, meetings, event attendees, you know, to happen. Um, so it's, you know, it's a fraction of the cost of employing someone in a business. Uh, and yeah, and beyond that is then just a monthly subscription, two week notice period. So it's, it's look, as these things go, it's, it's very low risk. Yeah, no, so, I love that. Well, cause so much of, I mean, engaging with a, a partner in marketing and especially if you really don't know anything about what you're doing, you know, if you're totally naive to, to social media marketing and you're going to rely on an expert, I mean, there's a, like we talked about before, a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of people who claim to be one thing who aren't. And and there's a lot of that. So making that decision is really difficult. So having your pricing just totally transparent like that, I think is a, is a great strategy, especially for smaller businesses who might go, you know, okay, I, I know what this is going to cost. It's not going to be this random, you know, bill that I get for tens of thousands of dollars or something. And, and so I think that that's a really smart approach. So say, for example, I go and, and I sign up for that $1,500 package. Are you doing the ad buys out of that budget or it, and are you not doing any ad buys? Are you doing all organic um, and unpaid for kind of traffic? Is that your MO? Is that kind of what you go for? So most of our work is organic social media. So that's to say the results you can get on social media without pouring money into advertising. Um, we do do some very modest amounts of advertising for some clients uh, and where we do that, that is covered 
within that subscription. Um, so if, for example, we started work with a business and they let's say they didn't have a Twitter account, but we determined that actually Twitter would be a great place for them to reach the kind of decision makers they they need to reach well then we we might run some uh ad campaigns in the early days uh just to get that account you know some initial followers and, and a, a bit of an audience built um but most of our work is is organic so it's it's what can we do on linkedin twitter facebook etc that doesn't involve throwing lots of money at advertising yeah well and i think one of the things that people struggle with too you know especially if they're looking at this as a cost effective approach is, you know, the cost of hiring somebody to do things like, you know, write blogs and, you know, uh, create content and things like that are, you know, it can be cost prohibitive or time consuming or whatever it is. I mean, is a big part of what you guys do creating all that stuff? And are you working like hand in glove with somebody? Or is there sort of an advisor cap that you're offering to these people to sort of, I guess, steer what they're what they're producing? So um, we take on as a business everything that needs to be done to get results from social media. So if, for example, a client doesn't have any content of their own and we, you know, we figure out that them having some content of their own is going to be key to them getting results from social media, then we will ghostwrite some blogs or reports for them. Uh, but that's only if, you know, if that's determined that that's what's needed. Similarly, if a client needs to run some webinars in order to get results and they aren't able to do that, you know, we'll create the webinars and host them for them and they just turn up and, you know, present or answer questions. Um, but it, it very much dovetails with what the client's already doing. Um, so, you yeah, know, some clients we start working with, they're already producing, you know, a blog every two weeks. And it's just really dispiriting for them because they're producing all this content and it's hardly getting seen at all. Um, and obviously, at that point, we'll just tap into what they're already producing. Um, so it's, I guess what I'm saying is it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, it's very much each business understanding who it is they want to reach, what assets they've already got, and, and therefore, what plan of action we think makes most sense to achieve outcomes for that particular business. Um, if you took yeah. 10 of our clients and you sort of looked at, OK, what are we doing for them to get results? It'd be 10 different sets of activities, uh, often with you know varying uh, outcomes that they're looking to drive as well. Okay. Well, one of the things I noticed, or I think is particularly interesting about you guys is that, so you tame, and correct me if I'm wrong, by the way, um, I, I believe that a lot of your focus is on sort of service industry, right? So it's consultants, it's recruiters, it's small businesses, it's people who are doing a service-based business, basically. Um, you know, not to say that you wouldn't be capable of doing other things, but from what I could see on your website, it seems that, um, I, I, you know, thought work is a big part of what you you guys market to. And in my mind, and, you know, and I mean, I run a marketing agency, we don't special in social, social media, but um, it's always been challenging for me to do things, especially with small operations, you know, where maybe there's an individual who is at the core of a business or, you know, is the lead consultant or, you know, who, you know, sort of the driver for the company's business. Um, it seems that it's very challenging to take that person and generate business in a way on, you know, through social media channels, especially um, that typically is done sort of by handshake and smile. Right. So this is, you know, especially like with consultants and stuff, these are people who go to meetings and networking events and they meet each other and stuff like that. So can you talk about any challenges specifically, you know, that you guys have overcome or ways that you've learned to manage working for service professionals, uh, you know, in social media? Like, how do we, you know, is it about brand reputation? Is it a company development? You know, I mean, are, are there anything in particular that's unique to service industries that you can talk about? I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, our focus is B2B and a lot of our clients are in professional services. Um, my previous business was a job board for the management consulting sector. So my clients there were management consultancies, IT consultancies, and recruitment businesses. So obviously, it, it then made a lot of sense that uh, those kinds of businesses would be uh, the ones that we'd be best placed to to help uh, when social hire was launched. Um, I think the big uh, mistake you see those kinds of businesses make, and therefore the kind of mindset shift uh, you, you want to encourage, is they're very often are focused on thought leadership. 
So if we can produce a report that shows that we are the experts in, you know, whatever it might be, and then we can push that out and get it seen by as many of the right people as possible, then the phone is going to start ringing loads and we're, we're going to get loads of business. That tends to be the mindset of B2B professional services companies. And actually, we would flip that on its head and we would say, what do you need to win more business in the type of business you run? And generally, the answer is more conversations and more meetings with the kinds of business decision makers that ultimately, you know, we would do consulting work for. And so if you take everything they do and you flip it on its head and you say, okay, how can we take what you're doing and turn that into something that generates conversations, then you do everything totally differently. So if I give you an example there, you know, if a consulting firm is going to write a thought leadership report on whatever sector they serve, well, why don't you reach out to decision makers in those types of companies and look to interview them and get their insights to produce the next thought leadership report that you're going to produce. And that way, instead of producing a report and hoping it gets seen by the right people, you flip that on its head and now said, right, we're going to have 50 Zoom meetings with our ideal clients to get their input on all the challenges there are in this market right now. And, and therefore, you've, you know, you've opened the door and you've started conversations with, with 50 potential clients rather than hoping that publishing the report is going to produce those kinds of meetings. Yeah, that's yeah. hilarious. Does that makes sense. Well, it's yeah. an interesting point. You know, it almost is like, I mean, what I'm thinking of is almost like the, the Simon Sinek start with why thing, right? Um, mm. I think the impulse, especially of small business people, is that I have a solution for your problem. Let me tell you about that solution. Here's your, here's your thing, right? And I've got the, the answer for you. And really what you need to do is stop and let them tell you their problem. <laughs> and so, you know, so in the case of what you're describing, I mean, it's it's a little bit that, right? It's, you know, how, how could I as a consultant try to pretend to know what your needs are without having spoken to you first? You know, and so, and I think there's a, a I don't know if it's an arrogance or an egocentrism or, a, you know, something. It just, it seems like human nature to sort of lead with a, I, I have a solution mm -hmm. to your problem instead of you have a problem, tell me about it. And then let's talk about a solution. So uh, I think that's an interesting insight. And it's it's almost about adapting to the existence of social media. Because if you think of those types of businesses, historically, you know, we go and present at a conference where we are the invited expert speaker on whatever topic it might be. And we present to a whole auditorium of decision makers from our industry. And then after having given that presentation, you know, we get loads of business cards and then that turns into some meetings and, and some follow-ons afterwards. You know, that's the way, if you go back 20 years, that those kinds of businesses would operate. Um, and so they're thinking about social media in the same way. Could we, you know, create a video of ourselves talking about this topic and get it seen by loads of the right people so that they then, you know, contact us? Whereas actually where social media is more powerful is if you use it to open the door in the first place and, and get those conversations, uh, you know, independently of how much your content is actually being seen. So it's as someone who's hosted a podcast now for five years, um, I talk, I do it myself. I'll go after people that I want to talk to, invite them on the show and use that to open the door to work down the road, just have that contact, whatever. And, and having the ability to, to just reach out and, and have a credible podcast and say, Hey, you want to come on our show? We'd love to talk about whatever you're doing. It, it kind of, it, it reverses the, the approach instead of cold calling and saying, Hey, I need a job, you know, um, mm -hmm. or, Hey, I, I'm looking for this, have them on as an, and as an experienced guest as an expert and you a develop the relationship b you have the content to share and it, your approach is coming uh, from someone as you know i i'm a in the same field here let me let's discuss this topic and it, it actually is a, a really unique vehicle to be able to do stuff like that so just yeah, it seems like, out. you know, and I think it's the same in sales or anything, right? It's value creation, right? I mean, we need to give you a reason to have a conversation with me. 
And yeah. I think, you know, back to Mike's example for the 40th time of the, you know, dancing uh, credit union person, you know, like, I don't know who that serves, you know, like, I, I, I mean, it's not really offering value, you know, maybe I'll laugh or something, but like, I don't know. I mean, do I want my bank to be the one that I laugh at? Like, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to stick my money in the bank that I think is really funny. And so, um, you know, so it, it's interesting that the the way so many people approach it is not this, right? They're, they're not, you know, creating content for a problem they think exists rather than sort of, I guess, inviting people to tell them what the problem is. And the way I would really um, encourage people to think about this, and it's, it's sort of an example I like to to share with people is, would you as your business rather stand up in the stadium where the Super Bowl is going to take place and have 10 minutes to talk to everyone in the audience about what it is your business does. And that's just, you know, loads of random members of the public, all sorts of ages, demographics, whatever, all sorts of different businesses they work in. Or would you rather go and speak at a business breakfast where there's only a hundred people in the room, but, but they, they are, are qualified. All the exact types of decision makers that your business typically sells to? Well, I would say in that scenario, most business owners, certainly of niche businesses, would say, I'd much rather have that audience of 100 of my ideal clients than hope that somewhere in the stadium, someone is listening who's actually a, you know, a good potential client for us. Can, um, yeah. And if you take that analogy and then you port that to social media, well, the equivalent is to say, OK, our business doesn't need to be seen by the whole world to be successful we just need to be seen by this type of decision maker and we need that to turn into conversations and meetings with those kinds of people and if that means that most people in the world have never heard of our business actually that doesn't matter so long as the right people have and that opens the door with the right people um then that's where success comes from yeah can can you talk about how you filter out the people who don't necessarily match the criteria. Um, so when you're trying to contact people, I mean, it, starting from scratch, how do you go about and say, I need to find a thousand people that all do this job? Are you looking on LinkedIn and you're trying to, okay, I need a CEO that's in this field that does this, and you're trying to filter out that criteria and then you direct message those people? Or is there another approach that, you know, instead of the more manual approach of actually doing it physically is there like tools that you use yeah so it could be linkedin and you're searching for you know particular job titles and certain companies you want to target um, it could be you're targeting facebook groups that already exist for particular uh you know niche audiences um in some cases it could be that building that audience on twitter is the right approach but i mean what what we focus on and what I would encourage any small business owner to focus on really are three things. One is growing your audience of the right people. So whatever social media platform you're going to be on, figure out how am I going to grow quarter on quarter the number of decision makers who are our ideal clients uh, that, you know, that, that our message is going to reach. Secondly, then, how are you going to build trust with those people? Because let, let's say I get, you know, 100 new connections on LinkedIn and they're all our ideal clients. But those people don't know me. They've never seen me talk about anything. They don't know what I'm expert in. If I suddenly try and get, you know, a call with them or I look to invite them on along to an event we're running or something like that, you know, they, they don't know me. They don't believe I'm an expert in, in anything. And so the trust isn't there you're trying to make a sale too quickly basically so the second thing you need to do alongside growing the audience is then build trust so you need to be posting things and engaging in conversations in your you know your niche market that make other people perceive you as a real expert at what you do um, and then the third thing is converting you know don't post and and, and engage and hope that that's going to make the phone start ringing actually figure out what am I going to do that's going to turn this audience into people who've said, yes, I, I'd like to come along to your next business breakfast or yes, I'd love to be your next podcast guest. Um, and if you can get those three things right, then actually with a relatively small audience on social media, 
that can then produce a, a pretty consistent flow of you know zoom calls meetings business breakfast attendees uh you know whatever it might be yeah one of the things that you mentioned earlier is that a maybe an ideal candidate you know and maybe you'll uh, be open to other people too but maybe an ideal candidate would be somebody that could sort of articulate who it is they want to try and reach or knows their target audience. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you mentioned that not everybody can articulate it very well leads me to think that, you know, you probably come across a lot of small business owners who don't really know who they serve. They've created a widget or they've run a, you know, created a a consultancy based on their experience, but they don't really know their customer, uh, so to speak. Um, Can you say, or, you know, we talk about I guess what part of your business is a little bit consultative in that, you know, if somebody is having trouble articulating that person, can you help them or are they just sort of cast out to go figure it out on their own? And when they get back from their spirit quest, they can hire. You. <laughs> um, m- more often than not, you know, businesses we're talking to will, will know who their ideal audience is already or with, some prodding questions some probing questions from us they'll be able to you know get to the point where they can articulate that they, they may not always have thought it through in advance of talking to us um, but once we start asking them you know if you think of your last 10 sales you've made you know how did those sales come about who were the decision makers that that you needed to talk to for that to happen um, if if we could get you another 50 meetings with people like that would you be confident that would turn into more business for you and obviously depending on the answers that come back you you either help them really refine down to who they need to be talking to um or you've thrown up uh you know the fact that they simply don't know and it's been a bit haphazard and and potluck up until this point um but there are also to, to make the distinction there are businesses where who they want to go after, it's much harder to target on social media. Um, so uh, if, I don't know, if you sell a technology platform that helps salespeople be better at their, their job as a salesperson, or you're a sales training company and, and you help salespeople get better at, at selling, well, clearly if you having enough conversations with sales directors, VPs of sales, you know, your sales decision makers, it's only a matter of time before you're going to be talking to one of them who's got a real problem at the moment that they need to, you know, bring in an external tool or some external training uh, to ramp up the sales results they're getting. Whereas there's other types of businesses where you're not, you don't have that same certainty that same confidence um so i'll give you a a classic example at the moment um we see loads of businesses uh, approaching business owners who help you secure office space and they are you know helping companies that have got office space to rent out that office space to small businesses but the problem is you can't readily see on social media which businesses are remote and which businesses do actually have an office. And so that is a really unproductive use of social media because you could contact a hundred entrepreneurs and every single one of them might be running a remote business. So not a single one of them is a potential client for you trying to sell office space. Yeah. Does, no, I does that, do you, you see the distinction I make there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. And I, I guess I'm trying to think too. I mean, what about the person who comes to you, the, I don't know, the the green consultant that, you know, has a general business management experience, for example, but could really speak to a lot of topics. Do you help them niche down and choose a, a directive? You know, like, so in your example, you know, you guys sort of, okay, well, this is a bad use of social media, so there must be good use, you know, so let's look at a different audience. Is that part of the discussion too? Is, you know, maybe maybe you serve 10 different verticals really well, but just for like an efficiency standpoint, we need to narrow it down to one or two. Like, I mean, is that sort of some of the decision-making process that happens in an engagement with you? Absolutely right. Yes. Um, and there's a couple of, there's a couple of different things there. The first is 
how good is your conversion? So you may do, you may have 10 different service lines that your business offers, but once you drill down into it, perhaps one of those is one where, you know, for every two or three prospects you talk to, you end up closing a piece of business because you're really good at selling that particular service line or the track record that you've got and the client testimonials and the case examples you can give um, mean you're really convincing and are able to sell that particular service line. Whereas when you talk through some of the other service lines, they're things that they've done some of uh, or that they have aspirations of getting into, uh, but it's going to be a lot less fruitful to try and help them ramp up that part of the business. Um, and that comes back to what I talked about early on about plugging into an existing sales process that we know works. Um, so if I've got a business comes to us and says, you know, we do this thing already and we'd really love to get into this thing as well, then I would always say, right, well, let's start off having your social media ramp up the results you're getting from what you already are good at, because then you can prove the impact of social media quickly. And then if further on down the line, they want to extend it into the new thing they want to get into, then then great. Uh, but yeah, so that would be one one, you know, key distinction. Um, and and yeah, just the track record that people have in certain things, um, you know, as, as, as a professional services business or a B2B business, it's a every other call you have, someone's going to say, oh, you know, can you talk me through an example of having worked with a business like ours before or having got results for a business like the kind of results we want to get? Um, and if you have broadened out too much and you're trying to do too many different things, uh, then, yeah, your success is just going to be uh, really stifled. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, one thing I wanted to get into, and we sort of touched on this a little bit with how service professionals can maybe position their language or, or, you know, approach conversation on social media. But I wondered if you had any other like sort of social selling hacks that people might be able to employ if they're, let's say, you know, a small business, maybe they're not totally ready to engage uh, a company like yours or, or any agency for that matter. They're just doing it on their own. And they're really trying to figure out how to maximize their time or do well on it, you know, and maybe in preparation for bringing somebody on down the road. You know, how do we are there are there tips or are there there are things that we could be doing or or maybe specifically uh, more specifically not doing that are causing harm or actually setting us up for failure versus, you know, a, a slow build to the point where we could maybe engage with somebody like you. Um. There was a really interesting uh, survey of social media managers done just before Christmas about how many hours a week do you need to do a good job on a social media platform? And uh, the answer was about 20 hours a week per platform that a business wants to have a good presence on. Um, I draw attention to that because uh, you could really really uh, lose a lot of time and get very little in the way of results if you're not devoting enough resource to social media. Um, because if you're going to need that kind of amount of time to do a really good job on a platform, clearly, if you're only able to put in, you know, a couple of hours a week to this, you're just setting yourself up for failure from, from the word go. Um, I think, but to answer your question about quick wins and, and hacks, what is interesting is to see businesses that already have quite an audience on, on social media, but they just haven't figured out how to get better results from it. Um, so quite often, we'll talk to a business where if you take the key decision makers in the business and you look at, for example, their LinkedIn uh, networks or in some instances, their, their existing Twitter uh, accounts, they may already have a lot of the right people connected to them. And, you know, so for them, it's just figuring out how do you make conversion work? And, and that's where you can get a really quick win with social media is if that audience is already built and they just haven't been able to figure out how to get, how to turn that into, into results. Um, and the biggest advice I could give there is focus on making 
your conversion conversational and thinking about what's in it for the other person rather than what you want to sell to them. Um, and, and to come to Mike's example earlier of, uh, you know, doing podcasts, I can give you a really great example of that. When, um, when the pandemic struck, we thought as a business, right, what can we do that would really help small businesses right now? Uh, we, you know, would keep us front of mind with people, uh, but wouldn't be selling, selling, selling at a time when, you know, people have just got bigger problems uh, that they're facing right now. And we said, well, why don't we, you know, a lot of our network are small business owners, consulting firm owners, recruitment business owners. They could all give great advice that would help people right now in the situation they're in. So we we set out and we use social media to approach these people and say, look, we're going to do a series of video interviews, just short, you know, five, 10 minute videos for you to be visible in your market uh, and share some great advice with people to help them right now. And that turned into our single biggest source of new clients. Love it. But had I, but because every, you know, every call I had with those people we we'd press stop on the recording and then they'd want to carry on talking to us and find <laughs> out more about what our business does and how could we help them right now. But if I'd approached those same people and said, hey, you know, the pandemic struck, uh, you really probably ought to do something about your social media. Why don't we jump on a call and see how social hire could help you? You know, if I'd taken that approach, I, I would have barely got a call the whole of that time. Whereas as it was, every day i was having fresh calls with small business owners and then it's just a, a numbers game you know for every five of those you have one of them turns into a client which is great yeah hey tony we're getting to that time do you want to tell us where uh people can reach out and get in touch with you uh yeah no that's very kind so uh the website is social hire uh there's a hyphen between social and hire but if you just search up social hire on google we'll be top of the page there um on the home page you'll find a book a call button so if you want to have a you know an exploratory chat with us you're very welcome to do that um or equally look me up on linkedin um you not won't be surprised to hear i uh, have a decent presence there and um <laughs> very open to connecting with people and and having chats there as well that's awesome well yeah thank you so much tony for doing this i mean i, I think that this is a huge topic and i think your approach is really smart this idea of, of sort of you know niching into it instead of chasing the vanity metrics and everything else so i really appreciate you taking the time and kind of breaking it down especially here at like the kickoff of the you know the first week of the of 2023 um i think that this will be really great for a lot of people in our audience and uh you know maybe help advise them going forward so thanks so much for taking the time it's been an absolute pleasure and anyone listening who'd like to have a further chat you know i'd be delighted to do that excellent well thanks so much then to uh mike and tony and everybody else who listens to the show this week and every week and we'll see you all next time